Hello, students. Good evening. Welcome to this class for international uh, diplomacy. Well, I think there are students who are still joining in. 15 minutes buffering time is already done. In fact, it's already up. But I will admit probably for another five minutes some other students so that they will not miss it. However, still, in case you miss it, there's always a recording that is always posted in the Google Classroom. So without much wasting of time, let's begin with the lecture. I'll not be putting my video on because uh, I mean, I've been quite uh, busy through the day and uh, this is almost my uh, I mean end of the day for me so well I will not be putting my video on but you can ask always any questions whatever you want to ask me you can ask questions you can just raise your hands and in case you do not understand anything please feel free to ask me clarification well now let's begin with the class so uh, can anyone recapitulate what we learned during the last class. I understand we did not have an online interaction, but yet there was uh, you know, pre-recorded video which was uploaded in the Google Classroom. The lecture was uploaded. We learned about the types of diplomacy, but can any one of you recapitulate if you have just gone through it? I'll give you just one minute in case you can, please do that. If not, you are expected to go through the video and recapitulate for me during the next class. I will ask you the question on chapter two. I'll give you one minute if you can. Classroom interaction is, uh, I mean, examined by me as well, and it will be, you know, recorded and uh, I'll be awarding marks for that as well. Well, so for the next class, you are supposed to recapitulate chapter two, lecture two, types of diplomacy. I will ask you questions on that and you'll have to answer it online. Well, now let us begin with chapter three, ethics, morality, culture, and diplomacy. During the first class, we learned about, what did we learn? introduction to international diplomacy. We learned about certain concepts in international law and we then moved forward to learn about diplomacy. What is this diplomacy and what are the main functions of diplomacy and so on. And last class, it was about the types of diplomacy. So well, we have already established the truth or the fact that the main function of diplomacy is to ensure peaceful relation between countries. And there are these diplomats who are the face for the nations or for the particular nation that they actually represent and they negotiate their trade deals they may discuss any mutual problems they may talk about implementing um, say new policies or they may tackle some disputes and uh, and they do it in the uh, you know by communication by negotiation and by certain policy implementation and so on so we also saw that diplomacy is an art like how they represent it is an art in itself. It's also a science and the sci we call it science because it involves um, a, a particular methodology to maintain peaceful relation between nations, establish peaceful relation between nations, groups or individuals. And, uh, you know, often diplomacy refers to, you know, representatives of states like in international law, we call state parties or nations and uh, or state parties more so where it, they normally refer or represent certain groups where they discuss certain issues such as conflicting issues between the nations or trade, environment, technology, or maintaining security and so on. So what is the key part of diplomacy? So the, the mode or the, uh, what they say, the method or the act of conducting negotiations between two parties or two nations at a large scope for, uh, in the best interest of maintaining international relations and upgrading international affairs. So that is the most key element of diplomacy. I'm repeating, the, the key element of diplomacy is to negotiate, communicate in an appropriate manner, negotiate, and it is an art, it is a science, and it is, or where the, in the best interest of the nations to develop international affairs, to promote international affairs by communication, negotiation, and uh, 
in what way it would help? It would help probably in maintaining good relations, preventing war, preventing violence, and fortifying or strengthening the relations between nations. Now, if you have really, uh, you know, observed in the past week, or if you have really followed the news, um, United Nations General Assembly has been holding its, you know, normal meetings and different countries, uh, you know, represented in UNGA, and they put forth about the state of affairs of their country in the best interest of, you know, uh, and whatever concerns a particular nation has, a particular country has, you know, it tried to address it during the most recent uh, UNGA meeting, United Nations General Assembly meetings, which just took place during the last week, and it was there online. So uh, try to just uh, check up uh, the YouTube and, in the sense, check out in the YouTube uh, and uh, see for the online sessions of UNGA. There are several countries which participated, including India, Iran, USA, and so on. This has been discussion between just for your knowledge, there has been discussion between different uh, uh, represented diplomatic, uh, you know, representatives of any every nation. Like for, from India, there was a person um, who represented, who was a foreign affairs minister there, and he represented India. And there are other nations likewise. And even USA was represented by a particular diplomat. And so when they spoke about the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia, and then Iran, you know, what is the problem which is going on in Iran, where there was a girl who was, uh, you know, uh, in the sense she was killed. I would use the word killed and uh, because she did not she want she was fighting against uh, you know compulsory hijab so she was there was a kind of moral policing and these moral policers or police this moral police they uh, you know they caught hold of her and then she was killed and now uh, you know across the globe there is a big hue and cry about that about a girl being killed for i mean according to them they have their own um you know their own opinion saying that it is not compulsory hijab is not compulsory it is not mandatory and so on i want you to watch those debates as well which is going on um uh, worldwide and of course you can just follow up bbc or cnn and you can get ample of information on that and how you know, these countries are representing themselves and how they are putting forth their proposition and their stand before the United Nations. And we will study about the role of United Nations and diplomacy somewhere after maybe in lecture five or six. But well, I want you to go through these sessions, UNGA sessions and uh, just see like how the diplomats are representing the nations and so on. But today we are going to do about ethics, morality, culture, and diplomacy. Ethics, morality, culture plays a very important role in diplomacy. Why? Because you see culture, nations have different cultures. There are different cultures across the globe, but yet sometimes culture may be a barrier. But in today's scenario, people have, uh, you know, nations rather are accepting the culture of every other nation. And there is a concept of world committee. They want to build good relation and brotherhood among different nations in the world. If you have gone through my previous uh, you know, lecture recording, I want you to go through that in detail and you know, really see how I have given you examples of different countries in the light of the Ukraine and Russia, Russia war and how what is a stand there. And at present, the present situation in Russia is, of course, it is kind of getting aggravated. And uh, President Putin has invited all uh, men from Russia to participate in the war. And that is the reason many of them are leaving Russia and they're taking refuge in different parts of the world, in Georgia and different parts of the world, including UAE, that is United Arab Emirates. Well, now what is ethics and morality? Of course, the name itself is self uh, you know, explanatory, but uh, normally diplomacy and ethics, they always had a relationship from the beginning. What is normal ethic is respecting the, 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 
the laws of the other country, respecting the values of the other country, respecting the culture of the other country. So that is normally ethics, where uh, sometimes it might pose a problem because unknowingly a person may, uh, you know, represent or behave in a particular manner that may, you know, uh, harm the sentiments of some other nation. It can be done unknowingly, you see. But that's why sometimes it can create a controversy. However, in today's world, it has uh, really evolved into a mature form of, uh, you know, governance and uh, diplomacy has, you know, crossed the ken of uh, all those minor disputes where the world has grown to respect every other nation's uh, you know, culture, ethics, but certain things might happen unknowingly, but still they are working on towards that. And um, yeah, they are building that kind of a relationship and trying to uproot all the constraints between peaceful, with, that comes in between peaceful relations with other nations. Having that said the perspective, let's go through our slides. Ethics and diplomacy, what is a nexus? What is a connection? Ethics and diplomacy was always connected. Now, practically, according to international diplomacy, if you think about that, ethical consideration is said to be a circumstantial consideration. Why are we saying circumstantial? consideration. It is because depending upon which nation it is, which nation is uh, represented and who are the other state parties who are representing. So based on that, we would say it is a circumstantial consideration because if you see the world is divided, one is you have a democratic setup, another you have sometimes religious setup. You know, some of the nations have a, you know, a state religion. They have a, a, a religion that is, uh, you know, you know, governing a particular uh, country, for example, you have setups which are democratic in nature, which are secular in nature, which says that, okay, religion, we have a particular religion, but we are secular in nature and all religions can peacefully coexist. Not that in the other nations, uh, which are religious in nature, that all religions cannot peacefully coexist. It is not that. However, they, they have a particular form of functioning. That's the only difference. So when they have a particular form of functioning, the other nations need to understand that the, other, the particular nations which uphold religious principles, they have a particular form of functioning. And in the course of diplomatic, uh, you know, diplomatic uh, intercourse or diplomatic talks between them, they need to respect the certain barriers which may be there and overlook those barriers and aim towards building you know peaceful relations peaceful international relation and in the best interest of fortifying the international relations of fortifying relations between all the nations so therefore ethical consideration is said to be circumstantial consideration diplomats represent their country and negotiate matters on behalf of collective authority thereby they not only represent the government government of that nation but also its people. There was this person, Newman, he pointed out that diplomatic agency is thus the result of conditional transfer of prerogatives from the legitimate authority to the diplomat. So you see here, there is a conditional transfer, there is a kind of, you know, a delegation, a subdelegation of prerogatives or an authority does, or legitimate authority that is given to the diplomat who represents a particular nation. A United Nations document, it specified that it is this delegation of authority that makes it possible for diplomats to perform their traditional functions of representation, information gathering, and negotiation. How do diplomats represent? It is because of the delegation of authority. They are given certain authority on behalf to talk on behalf of a particular state party or a nation. They are delegated. So with the authority that is given to them, they perform certain traditional functions such as representation, information gathering, gathering and negotiation. Oh, I'm sorry. Next is thereby diplomacy necessitates the use of prudence and practical wisdom, thus exhibiting the need for phronesis. What is phronesis? Now, phronesis is nothing but an ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. That's called as phronesis. I'm repeating, you know, Prudence, exercising prudence along with practical wisdom. 
is phronesis. And in reality, what is phronesis? That is practically, it is the ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. So diplomacy actually attracts the need for exercising prudence and practical wisdom, not just theoretical wisdom, but practical wisdom, prudence with practical wisdom that is fortified with the ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Now, Aristotle, Aristotle he was a Greek philosopher and he advocated phronesis in every sphere of life, be it from general living to household management and even from politics to diplomacy. So Aristotle was of the opinion that this concept of phronesis, that is, this ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way is not just confined to diplomacy or diplomatic relationships or just simply even to politics. In fact, phronesis has to be exhibited in every sphere of life, whether it is your normal living, that is general living, or even your normal household management in the way you perform your normal household chores, and even take, be it politics, or carpet job, or even diplomacy. So phronesis need to be, it needs to be exhibited. That is, you know, you use prudence, how well you use prudence, how you use your wisdom, that is practical wisdom. You couple prudence and practical wisdom with the ability to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Now, there is no code of ethics to be really followed in the international diplomacy context. I mean, there is no real entire document that says this is international code of ethics for diplomacy. There is nothing existing till date, you know, in that direction that is code of ethics that is to be followed by international diplomacy. However, diplomacy entails responsible communication. Why? Because diplomacy is all about communication. Diplomacy is about negotiating why communication. So it diplomacy entails responsible communication fortified with the art of communication in conformity with the laws and regulations of a nation. So it has to be within the ambit of laws, whatever you communicate, it should be within the ambit of laws or general laws and regulations of the nation. So responsible communication, which has to be communicated very well in conformity or in, uh, you know, within the ambit of laws and regulation of the nations. Now, diplomatic ethics poses two plausible questions. One, to what extent can a diplomat be held accountable for his actions in terms of ethics? And two, to the extent to which they exercise delegated power in the process of negotiating and communication. Are you understanding me? So diplomatic ethics poses two possible questions. One, to what extent is this person, this particular diplomat, to what extent can he, he be held accountable for his actions in terms of ethics? Now, of course, here we see that there is a need for phronesis. You speak, you speak prudently with practical wisdom. You know what to do at the right time. You do the right thing at the right time. So there is a need for phronesis. So is this diplomat accountable for his actions in terms of ethics? So the extent of which actually needs to be determined to what extent, so it depends upon case to case, whether he has spoken on his own authority, whether he has you know, spoken in uh, consultation with the other state leaders. So to that extent, he, should, he would be held accountable. Next is, what is the impact of his uh, diplomatic intervention upon that particular state party or upon the nation? So the extent to which they exercise delegated power in the process of negotiation and communication. Next is morality and diplomacy. So there was this US president way back in 1912, whose name was Woodrow Wilson. He advocated moral diplomacy 
um, with the aim to coordinate and improve relations with nations that replicate similar beliefs and whose systems are analogous. So he basically concentrated on developing relation between systems or legal systems or nations that you know, share similar beliefs or whose systems are analogous, that is, whose system are similar in nature. So he advocated that form of diplomacy. However, today the concept of diplomacy has broadened and encourages establishing relation with every nation and every legal system, be it, you know, just analog systems, but you go beyond an established relation with every kind of country. You see, every country is wants to establish relationship with every other country. It's not just confined to analogous legal systems or systems that are similar in belief or similar in their functioning or method of functioning. And so for example, I said there is a democratic setup or a secular setup. There is a religious setup and so on. There are civil countries. There are common law countries. So whatever type of country is even if it is not analogous in nature, even if it is not similar, today's concept of di diplomacy has broadened and it encourages establishing relations with every nation and every legal system. What is modern diplomacy? Modern, what is modern diplomacy as what we see today? The, the state of affairs today. So a prominent feature of modern diplomacy is the internationalization of domestic politics, where diplomats have become conceptual thinkers, defenders, and experts in handling crisis. So today, what you can see around is these diplomats have, you know, really uh, have begun thinking out of the box, performing things which are beyond their normal, uh, you know, profile. And they have become conceptual thinkers, defenders, and experts in handling crisis. Defenders to the extent where they are the voice of the nation and they defend in case, uh, you know, a country engages in a particular, you know, international wrong or it trespasses any international regulation. Like you see, if you look at the news, you would see that you know, the world is dead against Russia. Before we move further, just in case we get disconnected, please join back. So I'm talking about Russia. You see, the world is against Russia. The friends of Russia are trying to convince Russia that please, you know, just stop this war and use diplomatic means to somehow solve the issues or the, the body issues or the issues that you have with Ukraine. But, you know, uh, Russia isn't really budging. In fact, it has called for a war and it has invited every male of Russia or Russian men to participate in the war. So it is kind of strategizing towards a real war. And therefore, there are Russians themselves, the citizens of Russia, they themselves, some, most of them are not really convinced with Russia's, uh, you know, strategy that is a president's strategy. And they are kind of, you know, evacuating out of Russia or they're kind of leaving Russia and taking refuge in other nations. And the question is, how much will the other nations allow Russians to inhabit their country? For example, Georgia. Georgia is raising concerns because thousands of thousands of Russians have already kind of, um, I wouldn't use the word infiltrated, but I would say that they have sought genuine refuge because where would they go? They are fleeing for their lives. They are saying, I'm not interested to participate in the war. I'm not for war. I'm not interested. Each, each family is saying, no, we are not interested to send our brothers or a husband or a father, you know, to for the war. We are not interested. And even those men are saying, no, this this is not a strategy that, uh, you know, in modern politics, that that is not aligning to our education that we have, you know, have really inculcated within us. This is not the world today. This is not, and as India keeps on banging upon the phrase that this is not an era of war. So therefore, and now Russia is slightly bent upon, that is what we try to understand. It's bent upon kind of using certain nuclear weapons. Now, again, UNO, the United Nations Organization, is trying to talk it out of you know, this particular proposition. And you know, it does not want the use of 
you know, nuclear weapons because again, nobody is interested in bloodshed and wiping out human beings from, you know, from the land, from their land, or wiping out human race at all, because nuclear weapons have, you know, a, a, I mean, it, that is disastrous. It is, you know, disastrous, really. So that's what is the, you know, kind of a strategy that is going on. But well, modern diplomacy, so it calls for internationalization of domestic politics in the sense, the world will intervene in your boundary in the sense internationalization of domestic politics what's the problem within your boundary what's the problem within your country if it's really having a, you know a you know a drastic effect upon your people or upon a nation's uh, population so the international uh, you know co community will intervene and say no you're not supposed to do this and not supposed to do that whereas probably that particular nation would say, well, it is my own personal problem. Why are you interfering? But today is the, you know, these are the times rather, you know, these are the times of internationalization of domestic politics. If the nation is able to give a real kind of, you know, a backup or, you know, it's able to um, really, um, you know, strengthen its argument. If the nation is able to strengthen its argument with enough evidence saying that we are entitled to a particular act, action, or, you know, or practicing a particular idea, for example. So then the nation or the state party can do it. However, if, you know, a huge chunk of people of that particular nation, they are not willing to do it, but the leaders of the nation are forcing them to do it, that in such a situation, you know, the international community interferes. So today, oh, in the, uh, talking about contemporaneously, we have internationalization of domestic politics. It's no more your own story. It's no more the story just only of India. It's no more only the story of Russia. It's just no more only the story of Somalia. It's not only the story of Africa, USA, UK, Canada. It's not only their own story. In fact, it is the story of the world. Are you understanding me? So today is the era of internationalization of domestic politics. If someone practices something that is inhuman, which is, which is against human rights, which is against humanitarian laws, international community will interfere and say, stop there, this is wrong what you're doing. And it will kind of, it has its ways of, you know, imposing sanctions or it has its ways of, you know, I wouldn't use the word punishing, but I would say that it has its way of imposing its, uh, its, its way through to cut out a particular nation which is engaged in a particular wrongdoing. Are you understanding me? So today we is the day, or rather, the current mo or the modern diplomacy. It normally it you know it magnifies internationalization of domestic politics. It you know it truly magnifies internationalization of domestic politics, and that is the song today. Modern diplomacy is about internationalization of domestic politics, where diplomats have become conceptual defenders and experts in handling crises if they may be there. And moreover, it reinforces a mechanism of building international cooperation that augments or calls for and fortifies globalization. Next is international diplomatic culture, international diplomacy, now here we are talking about culture and diplomacy. What is the effect of culture? And just even before we go through the slides, I want you to think about this. You know that different countries have their own culture. And if you talk about India, India has got a, a vast culture in itself in the sense that every state within its, uh, you know, within the nation has got its own culture. 
What you see in one state will not be in another state. The language of one state is not the language of another state. The way they dress in one state is not the way how things happen in the other state. Everything is different. The thought process is different. So India is a nation where you have different cultures under one, you know, kind of under one roof. So it is, you know, it has got varied culture. So therefore they say it's got rich culture. They call it rich in the sense because it's got different types of people different types of people, color, race, the way they talk, the way they behave, the dressing, their, I mean, everything is different. So likewise, if India itself is having so many different kinds of people and different kinds of culture, the world itself is having different kinds of culture. You see Africa, for example, Africa is divided into different places. Again, they have their own culture. I'm not really sure about the dressing part of it, but again, there is different culture, different people, different dialects, different language again. Again, you see USA. Again, USA has got, again, it's also divided, of course. I'm not talking about American English, but there are different places under that place. There are different islands which are part of the United States of uh, America. Then you take, it, you take Canada, or you take Australia again. The, you know, there are regions which still have aboriginals there. So, you know, uh, diplomatic culture or even Europe, you see Europe with different, uh, you know, nations, different nations, different culture, uh, different people, different uh, way of thinking, their mindset is different. Like if you go to Switzerland, their mindset is different. If you go to Germany, their mindset is different. Germany is more organized. If you think of, uh, say, other small nations like Latvia, again, thinking process is different. People are different. If you think of, uh, say, any other country, uh, say, France, again, it's different. People are different. Food is different. Everything is different. So international diplomatic cultures, so how will these diplomats represent? Now, just put yourself in that situation and say, now you are elevated to the position of, you know, a diplomat of your country. So what do you know of other nations?